Well, this week I had to confess that I hadn't waited until the 6th of January, the Feast of Epiphany, before I added the wise men to our nativity scene at home. Because, of course, the wise men weren't present at the time Jesus was born, but arrived to visit him some time later. Over Christmas, we reflected on all the bits that we've added to the Christmas story over the years. And these include the traditions that have grown up around these visitors from the East. In the Gospels, we're only told that they are Magi from the East. But Western Christian tradition always seems to have three Magi. Three wise men or kings, they come to be known as, probably because there are three gifts. And tradition has also given them names, Caspar, Melchior and Balthazar. As a child, my two sisters and I would take parts when we sang the carol, We Three Kings. I always brought the gold. I still love the carol. It's so visual and full of meaning, showing us how the gifts relate to the identity and the destiny of the Christ child. Gold recognising him as sovereign, recognising the rule of Christ. Frankincense, recognising the deity of Christ, that he is God. And more, foretelling the death and sacrifice of Christ. While the light of the star leads us ever to the greater light, Jesus, the light of the world. There is something to be said, isn't there, about learning our theology from what we sing. So it's important that we sing songs that have good theology. However, the real identity of the Magi is perhaps less comfortable than the wise men or kings we're familiar with. Because Magi were Zoroastrian priests from Persia or Media, which was Parthia in the time of Jesus. Magi were a priestly clan. They were scholars, tutors, dream interpreters, and gave accurate prophecies of future events. Their wisdom involved the heaven and its lights, stars. Astronomy and astrology and religion were very much bound up. Magi performed religious rites and gave instruction in religious and spiritual matters. They would be consulted by rulers. They're the sorts of people we see kings consulting throughout the Old Testament in the various nations. So their place here in the birth narrative of Christ is interesting. In the East, these pagan priests studying the stars recognise a star that signifies the birth of a king so great that it warrants an immediate and considerably long journey to visit him. In fact, the person signified by the star is more than a king. He is God himself and warrants worship and that is why they seek him, to worship him. In Israel, God's people, waiting as they were for Messiah, didn't seem to be looking in the right place. They, the keepers of God's law, which said that Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, don't seem to have noticed the event happening right under their noses. Did that bright star go unnoticed? And were the shepherds so overlooked and ignored that their reports of the good news their joy at what the angels had shared and the baby that they'd seen, did that go completely ignored? How ironic then that the people who had been longing for God's Messiah, longing for God's salvation, don't seem to really have been looking for it and certainly not in the right places. But despised Gentiles and surely the most despised priests of a pagan religion, should be looking and should recognise the signs and follow those signs to Jesus to worship him. Because this is the significance of the Magi's visit, that the light that has come into the world in Jesus Christ, the salvation that he offers and his rule are universal, not just for the people God has chosen, over all those centuries to be his light and example. This light, this salvation is for the whole world. While his own people did not recognise him, 
These unbelievers, these outsiders did. The Magi recognise who Jesus is and respond in the right way in worship. These highly educated, highly respected men bow down in worship. They bow down to the child Jesus. But this bowing down doesn't start when they see the child. It began way back when they saw the star and laid aside their lives in the east to make a very long and very dangerous journey to Israel. And the worship continues when they see Jesus himself and bow before him, offering their costly gifts, not just giving, but presenting as one would an offering or sacrifice to God. What a contrast to Herod. Herod is disturbed by the Magi's inquiry. And even when he's consulted the priests and teachers of the law and had it confirmed that the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem, this doesn't inspire rejoicing that Messiah may have come, nor worship, but the desire to protect his own power. Herod doesn't wish to worship. Herod certainly will not bow. For Herod worships only himself. There are two things that have struck me as I've read this account again this year. Firstly, that as those who count themselves as God's people, we need to be aware of our own blind spots. Just as God's people then didn't see or recognise Jesus, we can be blinded by our own ideas and traditions. Have you ever been surprised by the insight or the wholehearted reaction to Jesus of somebody unexpected, somebody whose beliefs or lifestyle are wildly outside what we might normally see in churches? This account reminds us that God is so much bigger than our ideas of him. He draws people to himself and they can often see with a freshness and devotion that we may have lost. We need to remember that God is a living God. His spirit blows where it will. He is creative and cannot be contained within the traditions that we have built around him. Secondly, I am challenged by Herod's reaction. His determination to preserve the status quo and his own power. Later, the priests and teachers of the law were also not prepared to relinquish their power, their security, way of life or beliefs. They were waiting for the Messiah, but they rejected Jesus because they were not prepared for him to be different than they had imagined. They were not prepared to be challenged and they were not prepared to change. They worshipped the religion that they had built around God and they refused to bow before Jesus. I wonder, am I any different? Are we any different? Are we ready to bow down to Jesus? Are we ready to relinquish the God that we may have created in our own image? To relinquish perhaps some of our beliefs? To relinquish every aspect of our life and offer ourselves to him? Because worship is more than a gift of half an hour or an hour of Sunday worship, or even a daily quiet time. Worship is life lived in service to God, which means service to others and to the most vulnerable of others. It's giving the costliest of gifts, our own time, our own money, our attention, our love, our dignity, our priorities. It's giving all in the name of Jesus. Are we ready to bow to Jesus? I wonder, is there something that you might worship more? Is there something that you might be scared of losing? Is there something that keeps you from total devotion? I ask myself the same questions. So let's spend some moments now in reflection. Pick 
picture yourself seeing the child Jesus with his mother. How do you feel? Are you overjoyed? Do you rush to bow down in worship? If so, then go ahead and worship him with all your heart. If you don't, then think about why. Ask the Lord to show you if you don't already know. And bring those things to the Lord, asking him to help you let go of all that would hold you back from total devotion. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for giving us the gift of your precious son, Jesus. Help us to let go of all that would hinder and hold us back. Help us to renounce all other things that we would worship. Help us to bow down and worship you alone. Help us to offer you our costliest treasures. Draw us to your feet in worship, your creation facing its creator, hearts laid bare by your light, humbly asking for your mercy. We come to you as a people in need of assurance and forgiveness. We come to you as a people in need of healing and wholeness. We come dependent upon your love. Draw us, we pray. Enfold us in your arms. Fill us with your spirit that we might reflect your light within this dark world. Speak your word with boldness and draw others to your feet. Father God, fill us with the joy of the Magi who understood who Jesus is, King of kings and Lord of lords, God incarnate, saviour and light of the world. Jesus, light of the world, shine your truth into our hearts and open our eyes to the fullness of your majesty. Holy Spirit, fill us anew that our hearts may bow down in worship, burning with joy, and our lives be given totally, the costliest offering of all, to our Saviour King, Lord Jesus. Let's continue to reflect and to worship as we sing or listen to, We Bow Down. <laughs> 